Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Fairhope, and we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd like for you to take out your phone and text the number that will be on the screen. Text welcome to the number that will be on the screen. And also there are some vis- there are some connect cards in your pews that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate on your way out. And just a couple quick things this morning. The lunch to go is available uh, outside the worship center as you leave today. And also, First Fairhope Women Premier will be August the 15th at 6.30 in the Commons area. And the ladies are out in the new Commons area to give you more information about that event that will be coming up. So as we get ready to pray, as we get prepared to worship, this is the time where we try to to clear our minds of the busyness of the week. Um, The things that we've got coming up this next week, the things that we've got today, let's clear it out so that we come before God uh, ready to worship with open hearts and open minds. So I'm gonna lead us in a word of prayer then turn everything over to Ryan. So God, we just thank you for this opportunity, Father. We thank you to be in your house. We thank you to be together uh, for this time of worship and praise and the preaching of your word. So God, right now, I pray that you open our minds, that you open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. And Father, if there is someone here that don't know you today, Lord, as Lord and as Savior, Father, I pray that they will not leave today without knowing you. So God, teach us today. Father, help us to worship in spirit and truth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Let's stand to our feet. You know, it's a great day always to come together and celebrate and just to sing praises to God. It's even almost a better Sunday when Sunday is your birthday. And so uh, you don't see her out here, but Miss Sharon Pippen, who is up in our media booth, she's our communications director and media coordinator. I don't know if she can hear you or not, but we can give her a round of applause just to honor her for her birthday. Thank you, Sharon. She keeps our lyrics straight and all of us straight. So we appreciate her and so thankful for, for her service and to come to work on her birthday. I mean, I think that's always a, a, great, a great thing. So um, we're just going to continue just to worship. And as Sean said, we're just going to open our hearts and minds and just sing to our Creator. You know, when you sing, it's always good to kind of visualize what's going on, right? It's, this is not for the sake of just singing. And this is just a tradition in what churches do. This is the time where we get to turn our hearts, turn our minds, and just think on him and thank him for what he has done and what he is going to do. So as you're singing, just think about your relationship with him. Just visualize that you get to sing to your creator, get to sing to your savior. And what does he want to hear from us? He wants all of our hearts. He wants everything that he created us to be for his glory. So let's don't miss that opportunity. Sean Dale.
sing like we believe. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on now. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. continue to worship. The one that lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit, who's guiding us, who's directing us, and we sing the call of who lives in us.
Jesus is calling And have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. is calling and bring your sorrows and train them for joy from the ashes a new life was born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide is the As you wait for a crown, 
Tell the world of the treasure you found. So God, we have found you, Father. The greatest treasure. Father, we just pray this morning we bring you glory, Father. And that we would worship you in spirit and truth. And God, as Dr. Hankins comes, open up your very word. May our souls, Father, just quake, Father, knowing that the creator of all things, the most powerful of everything, is speaking, speaking to us. God, we treasure you. We treasure your word, God. And thank you for allowing us to come, to sing to you, to read about you, to learn about you, Father, and to glorify you. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. I believe that a great argument can be made that the most important political speech ever uttered in the English language was delivered by Winston Churchill on June the 18th, 1940. It's known, if you're very familiar with Winston Churchill's speeches, this one is known as uh, the finest hour speech. On June 18th, 1940, the circumstances surrounding Britain could not have been more bleak. The British Expeditionary Force had been defeated on the continent. France had been taken by the Nazis The Wehrmacht of Germany was sweeping across Europe. It seemed like nothing would be able to get in their way. Several advisors around Churchill were encouraging him to begin seeking terms for surrender and peace with Nazi Germany. The people on the British Isles seemed trapped with nowhere to turn, facing down an enemy that seemed totally unstoppable. But it was in the darkness of this moment that Churchill's clarity of vision that brought him to be prime minister in that hour would help him to lay out a vision because he knew something, because of his understanding of the geopolitics of the time, because of his understanding of the nature of nationhood on the continent and beyond. He understood in that moment that it was absolutely critical that Britain make her stand. And so even though there would be a great cost, even though there would be many hard days ahead with courage and conviction, he called his people to stand firm on their island because it was going to play a critical role in the destiny of the world. And so in that fateful hour, Churchill delivered an address that was about 35 minutes and concluded with these words, words that I know are familiar to many of you, but let me share them again. Here's what Winston Churchill said. The battle of France is over. Now, as an aside, you remember Dunkirk had just occurred. The last moment, the British army was rescued from certain destruction and things were bleak. The battle of France is over. The battle of Britain is about to begin. Again, as an aside, what Churchill knew is that there was going to be a severe aerial bombardment that might be followed by invasion, the Battle of Britain. The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. And then here's a critical sentence. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. 
Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. It all came down to that island. Churchill knew that in that little block of space, the whole future of the continent rested. If Hitler was going to break the bonds of truth, if he was going to crush what had brought life to the West, he was going to have to do it on that island. And the people would have to make their stand. I believe in this day, as a church, as a people of God, this speech of Church Hills points towards the same sort of crossroads at which we find ourselves and calls us to examine the island on which we stand. In fact, I want to encourage you this morning. They are twin islands that must be defended. And if they can be successfully defended, because frankly, they're designed to be impenetrable, that even though the circumstances become very bleak around us, even though institutions around us might fall, if the church and the Christian family can stand, if the people of God Amen. If the people of God can st take our stand here in this hour, that we can this day and in days to come offer the world a gospel that is the only thing that enlivens and illuminates our lives, our family lives, and our life together as a church. And so we're going to consider together the relationship between family and the family of God. Now we're looking towards a passage of scripture that gives specific instruction to deacons. And I want you to hold a secondary, not a secondary thought, but an additional thought in your mind. As a church, one of the things that's good that we have and commanded to have are deacons. And next Sunday, we'll choose as a congregation the men uh, who will serve us in the coming days as deacons. And so we want to have a good idea about what well, what kind of men God would have us choose to serve and lead. But central to that idea of the servant leader in our church is one who is exemplary in his walk and in his life of faith. And so what we find is we look at the biblical instruction, the New Testament instruction about deacon leaders, and you find it in Acts chapter 6 and in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1. You do find some themes, three essential categories of characteristic. The first one, you, and I want you to know this and be praying, the first one is that, the, is that men who should serve us as deacons ought to be sound in their doctrine. They ought to know the gospel and be able to articulate the gospel. They know what they believe and hold fast to the faith. They ought to be clear in their doctrinal convictions rooted in the truth of the gospel. Secondly, they ought to have personal moral character. Not only do they believe the right things, but that belief shows up in their behavior, in the way they live. They are upright, holy, that they uh, promote peace in the midst of conviction. So they have the right belief, they have the right behavior. And then Paul will focus on their lives as leaders of their families. He's going to say, he gives an instruction a little earlier before we get to our passage. I believe it's in verse five. He says, he says, how can a man lead in the church if he cannot lead his own family? And so a man who leads his wife well, who leads his children well, who exemplifies biblical, beautiful, gospel-centered marriage, that man then is qualified and ready to lead in the church because for Paul, it was simply essential and fundamental that because of what it means to be created by God and in his image, that the life of the family and the function of the family is deeply rooted and wired to the identity of a Christian and to the functioning of our life together as a church. Let's look and see how that flows out here in this passage. First Timothy chapter three, beginning in verse eight, would you honor God in the reading of his word? Stand with me now. Paul writes, deacons, 
And deacon just means a servant, a ser servant leader. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or food or sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they're beyond reproach. Women, and, and, and I think that is better translated, their wives must be likewise dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. You can be seated. In the third of these categories doctrinal conviction, and gospel-centered behavior, and strong leadership in the home. I want us to look specifically, as we enter into a sermon series on the family, I want us to look specifically at, at what was in the, the mind of Paul and, 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 and through him, the mind of the Spirit concerning the family. What I want you to see is that God designed families to forge the men who lead the church. God designed the family. It's his idea, and it's designed for our flourishing. And one of the many things that families do is they forge men who lead the church. We can see this dynamic in three ways. First of all, the church is wired to the givenness of family. Paul is able simply to speak of the axiomatic nature of the family and of leadership. Once again, in, uh, in uh, verse 5, a man who doesn't know how to manage his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? It was simply axiomatic. In fact, uh, there's evidence even in the Greco-Roman world that that was well understood. If a man could lead his family well, that means he was, he was ready and conditioned and trained to do the work of leadership and influence in other areas. The family is where one learns his identity and his purpose. And then, of course, what Paul wants us to understand is that family must be primary. If you don't have it right at home, you need to get that squared away first. And then you'll be ready to serve elsewhere. And if you don't have that squared away, it doesn't matter what else you do. Your life will have missed a fundamental and central purpose if, you, if you're unfaithful men to the responsibilities of being family men. And so Paul can assume the fundamental role that family plays in the qualification of a man because he understood that family plays a role in the fundamental nat nature of God's created order. This takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 that tell us the story of what God is up to in making us. And so what's central in that proclamation, Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28, is that we are made in the image of God. If you want to know what the Bible says about what we are and who we are as human beings, we are image bearers. What that means is that we are made to reflect the glory, do God from creation to God. We're to be glory glorifiers of the one true God, and we're to reflect God's glory into all the earth, especially reflecting that glory through the way that we lead, through the way that we protect, uh, through the way that we uh, move outward in mission, so we are made as image bearers. God puts us on the planet as his representatives, his co-creators, his word speaker, speakers and redeemers to be a blessing to others and a blessing to the whole world. And our roles and design unfolds from that image bearing and it's right there in how, how Paul or how how. The Lord describes it in Genesis chapter one. What is this image bearing? First of all, it's an embodied image bearing. We are made with bodies. And our image bearing is, is hardwired to the fact that he, uh, God has made us as embodied creatures and there's a deep and fundamental goodness to it. I'll return to this in just a, a moment, but uh, we have a lot of discussion these days about biological males and biological females. Have you heard that? Uh, someone's a biological male. So here's what I want you to understand what the Bible teaches, because this is true. It doesn't just because the Bible teaches, just because the way it is. They're, 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 the, the only thing there are are biological males and females. That's what it means to be a male and a female is that biologically that defines you. Do you know that every single one of your cells 
is sexed, is gendered. We're deeply, deeply designed as image bearers. And so our bodies do tell us what's going on. We are embodied. Secondly, we're gendered. We're gendered. When, when we were made in the image of God, we were made male and female. What, we, what happens is, is we, we represent the image bearing of God in all the world as male and female. So we're embodied. That means we aren't a well, I'll, I'll return to this idea in just a second. We're embodied, we're gendered. Thirdly, we're family. We are, we are fundamentally representing the image of God as families, mothers and fathers and children. Adam and Eve, the first couple, are instructed, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over it. We are family. That's how we come into the world as members of a family. And so there's a father and a mother and, and a children dynamic to our very existence. And then finally, and here's one of your philosophical words for the day, we're telic, T-E-L-I-C, telic. To be made in the image of God, to be embodied and gendered and familyed also means, and it's one of the things that our bodies tell us, it tells, that our body tells us what we are for, what our purpose is, the, the ends for which we are made. That's, what we're, that's what's fundamental about why God made us. Now, we wrecked that. And the story of the good news is how God restores through the gospel all those original design plans for our image bearing, restored and expanded. So not only is the family restored, but then God expands the idea of the family of God so that it encompasses everyone who says yes to Jesus Christ. But we are renewed and reclaimed and restored in this original vision for our flourishing. It's made possible once again through the power of Christ, the ultimate human. And then here's what happens to us. I love this Trinitarian nature of this restoration. Paul will call us in the New Testament that he, he says that we are the people of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. That his Trinitarian nature invests our life once again. And that tells us who we are as a people together and also as families within it. And this orients us. It's the, it, it lays out the givenness of our very existence. You see, when Paul is writing here, he's writing to a culture that has uh, completely capitulated philosophically to the idea of dualism. What, what, uh, these new believers that Paul is writing to, uh, they have been taught that there's a radical break between uh, our spirit and our bodies. The body doesn't matter and the spirit is all that matters. So it doesn't matter what you do with your bodies and it doesn't matter what you do to other people's bodies. Just do whatever you feel like doing. And that the family structure really ought to mirror that kind of rebellion against the created order. But the call of a biblical worldview that really became dominant as the gospel invaded the culture. And by the end of the medieval period, there was this sense of the, of the unifying power of the biblical worldview that says we are creatures who've been, who've been invested with great value and we are a, we are a unity but with the emergence of the Enlightenment, that idea of dualism has returned to our culture. So that the conclusion isn't it began with Rene Descartes, who separated mind and body, and then with the empiricists, who said that what really matters are the facts, not the values. And then the romantics came along and they flipped that around. They said what really matters are the ideas and the feelings and not the body. But through this process, ending up in what's called postmodernity, which says uh, really all that there is are just your feelings about things and whatever you feel is really what's truly real. The body doesn't matter. Do whatever you want with it. We're just sort of ghosts inside of a machine. And as long as we're letting people do what they feel like doing, they're going to be happy and satisfied. And the only reason they're unhappy is when we tell them otherwise. That is not true. And it winds up in moral chaos. I heard the story this past week of a professor of endocrinology in the medical school system in the University of California system. And this 
professor of endocrinology wrote uh, uh, his students a, uh, an apology letter this past week. Oh, he was so apologetic. He had made a huge mistake. He had offended a lot of people. He had taught them the wrong thing. He had, he had uh, uh, warped their educational process, and he just wanted to express how very, very, very sorry he was for teaching them something that wasn't true. You know what he had taught his medical students? He had used the phrase pregnant women. And he had been called out for that error. He wanted to make sure that these medical students, these people who will be practicing medicine in California, can rightly know that men can have babies too. See, it's not rational. And it's rooted in a faith claim that you can make a radical distinction between the body and a person's identity. And it's a lie. And let me tell you what, what this lie gives us. It gives us abortion because it doesn't matter what you do with the body. And you can, uh, uh, there's a great book I'd encourage you to read called Love Thy Body by a, a philosopher and apologist. And her name is Nancy Percy. And, sh and she says it's called the personhood theory that you can actually create a difference between a human and a person. And until a human is a person, then their bodies can be denigrated. And the result of this is a denigration of the body. It's a denigration of gender roles. It's a denigration of that for which we've been created and intended to flourish. And so here's what really Paul is talking about. One of the things that, that godly men do, redeemed men do, and redeemed women and redeemed families do is they represent the truth to the world. They represent flourishing to the world. And that's a role and a responsibility that each man has been called to. And in their families, their characters are forged and ready so that they can live well and serve well and embody the right kind of character in their church and in the world. The family is a given. Our gender is a given. Our familiedness is a given. Our bodies tell us that for which we are created. Our consciousness of truth and of the transcendent is wired into our very createdness. And those things can't be separated. They're wired together for our good and God's glory. The church is wired to the givenness of family. Secondly, the church proclaims the essence of the family. So if, the, if we're forged in the family, what forges us? If we're forged in the family, what is it that makes the family work that goes on to make the church work? And so men are, first of all, deacons are called to be one woman men. We don't believe that uh, divorce automatically disqualifies a man from serving, but we do believe that what be, is being pointed out in this scripture is that men who are married, their character is a one of faithfulness and gospel-centered service to their wives. This pictured in Ephesians chapter five. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he's utterly committed to the good of his wife and there are no other women that compete with his marital commitment to her, not only to love her, but to lay his life down for her, to sanctify her with the washing of the word, to lead her spiritually. And so his marital relationship ought to be characterized by covenant and by sacrifice and by the gospel and by love. And he's to lead his family. That word uh, for manage really means to, uh, to, to, to lead the way by example and with a heart of protection. It's a, it's a picture of a, sh of a shepherd, one who deeply cares about and is attuned to the needs of those over whom he has been given responsibility. And so these men... These family men are to be good shepherds over the souls of their wife, over the souls of their children, and that this leadership that they give is a leadership of service and sacrifice. 
The picture here, uh, again, of these managers uh, is that they are giving careful attention. What Paul will say in verse five is you can't give care for the church if you don't know how to care for your family well. And that word for care is the same word that Luke uh, records Jesus saying as he speaks of the good Samaritan, someone who's giving very attentive attention to the needs of his family and willing to make whatever sacrifice he needs to make in order that they might have what they need spiritually. A couple of weeks ago, we had a a man named Jeff Strucker here to preach for us on one of our marvelous Monday nights. By the way, this upcoming marvelous Monday night, Dr. Chuck Kelly, a a recently retired um, president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary is gonna be preaching for us, and you don't wanna miss that. But uh, a few Monday nights ago, Jeff Strucker came and preached to us. Jeff Strucker was a Uh, was a platoon leader uh, in the Black Hawk Down incident. And he tells the story of leading his men into Mogadishu under incredible, in an incredible firefight, rockets and machine guns and uh, RPGs and uh, all of this chaos all around him. The, The original plan that had been laid out had fallen apart. But as a caring leader, as a shepherd of his men, Struker tells the story, number one, of keeping his men on the mission. That's why they were there. And secondly, looking out for them as they became afraid, as they got hurt, as they had needs. See, leadership, true leadership, is leadership not a a three-ring binder, but but it's an embodied and an engaged leadership of love and service and sacrifice, even, even and especially when things are very difficult. That kind of Grace-filled, sacrifice-filled love is what makes a great leader. And every great leader learns that kind of love first in his family and in his marriage. You've probably heard me teach this before. It's a little illustration I use when I teach um, uh, the the abstinence-only sex education course. They let uh, they let me teach the abstinence-only sex education course in the public schools in Baldwin County. Isn't that kind of crazy? But they, and if you want to go on a real adventure, teach sex ed to seventh graders at, at the public school. Uh, uh, you will not be bored, okay? And so one of the illustrations I use, uh, how many of you are familiar? I'm not going to ask if you watch this show. I'm just going to ask you if you're familiar with the show, The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Are you familiar it's okay, I'm not, I'm not taking a picture of the place, but, but you, you, you understand, uh, you, we, you take this beautiful man or this beautiful woman and you put them on a beautiful island and you surround them with people of the opposite sex and they've got to pick from 20 or 30 different people the person that's their, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that they want to marry, right? And when I, when, when I teach about what marriage really is, my, my thought occurred to me as I was thinking about that show, don't, don't take the couple and put them on Tahiti, don't, don't take the couple and put them on a beach in Hawaii with, with rose petals sprinkling down from the sky and gourmet food everywhere. Uh, put them in McDonald's with three children with the flu. <laughs> now we're going to find out what love is about. Now we're going to find out what commitment and relationship is about. In fact, here's the truth. You will find out more about yourself and about your mate and about your children in those circumstances than in any other That's how it's designed. It's fueled by sacrifice. It's fueled by the gospel. And again, even though we messed it all up, Christ, our sacrificial lamb, our good shepherd has laid down his life for us and he's restored us to that kind of service in the family. And so here again is what G.K. Chesterton says. I'm kind of on a G.K. Chesterton kick, so I would encourage you to grab some of his books. They're really, really good. He's really smart. And here's what he says about marriage. He says, the principle of marriage is this, that in everything worth having, even in every pleasure, there is a point of pain or tedium that must be survived so that the pleasure may revive and endure. The joy of battle comes after the first fear of death. The joy of reading Virgil comes after the bore of learning him. The glow of the sea bather comes after the icy shock of the sea bath. And the success of the marriage comes after the failure of the honeymoon. All human vows, laws, and contracts are so many ways of surviving with success this breaking point, this instant of potential surrender. Family teaches us how to love people who aren't like us. It puts us in close 
contact with each other over an extended period of time so that we know each other deeply and continue to love each other even though we're broken, we're different, and that every new day and stage brings a new set of challenges that are the context, the theater in which we can learn God's grace and we can learn what service and servant leadership is all about. This is who needs to lead in the church are men who know how to love well and sacrifice well and stay in covenant well. Even when things get hard and especially when things get hard. And then through that, the church is able to proclaim the essence of the gospel, which again is what Paul is focusing on as he teaches about marriage and family in Ephesians chapter five and six. In Ephesians five, he says, he says I'm really talking about the gospel. I'm really talking about Christ and his love for the church and how that's on display in the family. The church is wired to the givenness of family. The church proclaims the essence of family. And then thirdly, the church relies on the fruitfulness of family. Now, I want to qualify relies. The church doesn't rely on anything except the lordship of Christ. But what Paul is teaching here is a church that is underneath the lordship of Christ will have fruitful families in it. That will be the, the outflow of those families Christ-centered families are gonna, are gonna have relationships that are transformed. And so what happens is the spiritual maturity of the man is reflected in the spiritual maturity and faithfulness of his wife and children. What you see in the description of the wives here uh, in, uh, in uh, verse 11, it's the same adjectives that are applied to the men. Dignified and speaking the truth and, and, and those sorts of things. That when a man leads well and loves well and is mature, that's going to reflect, be reflected in the lives of his family. And so it's said in chapter or in verse four, when it's talking about elder leadership, that 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 elder is characterized by dignity and the way he leads his family is with dignity and his wife is also to have dignity. And the children are to be submitted, not by force, but willingly recognizing the spiritual authority of their father. Now, certainly they're gonna have to be disciplined as well. But the life of a servant leader in the church isn't coercive. It's one that through example and through consistently consistency ministers and calls his family to spiritual maturity so that his faith is handed on and then handed on to others. Several years ago, I was uh, at the Southern Baptist Convention, and often at the Southern Baptist Convention, you'll see the, the big-time pastors, okay, the, the, the mega guys. And it's fine to be big-time, and it's fine to be a mega guy. It's, you know, good for you, you know, uh, on, on some level. Uh, but it also doesn't automatically mean that just because you've grown a great big church, that that automatically means that you're walking the Spirit or, 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 uh, or um, as faithful as you need to be. And so... I found myself being introduced to one of the, of, the, of the rising stars in the Southern Baptist Convention. And he was known for leading this great big church. And he was, all of his numbers for baptisms were, were, were impressive. And he was a, uh, was a hard charger and type A and no hair, hair out of place and uh, had the latest fashion on and, and all that sort of stuff. He looked like he had it all together. But And I saw something very troubling. I met him, and then with him was his family and his children, and they looked completely beaten down, just shrunken and shriveled. The whole time we were talking, he never introduced them, and they never made a peep. His walk was not being reflected out of life, lives of his family and children, and it wasn't a couple of years later, the whole thing went to shrapnel because it was just a surface level spirituality that didn't even go deep enough to make any kind of impact on the people who were closest to him. And here's the deal, church, and here's the deal, men. You can hide your lack of spiritual maturity from a lot of people, but you cannot hide it from your own family. And it will show up in them. So one of the saddest features of the testimony of the Old Testament It's the failure of one generation to hand its faith to the next generation. Guys like King David, oh my goodness, what a man, what a a guy, what a leader, what what faith. 
And yet his children were hardly faithful. Most of them were destructive and rebellion, rebellious and godless. And that story repeats itself over and over and over and over again. There's a book I like that I recommend to you from time to time. It's a, a book called uh, uh, Spiritually, Shane, I just forgot. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Thank you, Shane. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro. And here's the thesis of that book. It's kind of a flaky title, but, but I promise you it's a great book. And the, the thesis is this. There's no such thing as spiritual maturity and emotional immaturity. There's no such thing as spiritual maturity and emotional immaturity. There's no such thing as a man who knows a lot of scripture and teaches Sunday school and can rattle off facts about the Bible and, and list doctrines and all that sort of stuff. And yet in his own home, he's controlling and angry and volatile and unreliable and harsh. There's no such thing as spiritual maturity and emotional immaturity place where your life of faith should show up most surely and most certain is in your relationship with your wife and your children. You have a biblical calling. It's by God's design. And then it readies you for your role in helping the church to be faithful and handing on its faith to the next generation. A study was done in a book called Why They Stay. Why They Stay. It was a uh, um, there, there's a troubling trend that many, many kids graduate high school in evangelical churches and then a big percentage, something like 75 or 80% of those kids leave the church after they graduate from high school. There may even be some of you here this morning who tell of a long season after you graduated from high school where you were far from the Lord. And so this book was investigating that percentage of kids, that 20% or so of kids who stayed in church, stayed faithful even after, even after they graduated from high school. And do you know what the number one predictor of a kid staying with the faith, the number one predictor? It wasn't a whiz-bang pastor. It wasn't an awesome programming. The number one predictor is if dad served in the church in a way that the kid could identify if the kid saw dad serving in the church, something like an 89% predictor of remaining in the church is what they saw dad do. Boy, that's a strong word. It's a great opportunity and a great responsibility. And it ought to be central to your calling and your life of faith as a man. Almost four years to the day after Churchill gave his speech about standing, defending that island, four years to the day, the largest amphibious invasion in human history was launched from that island. And because a toehold remained for freedom at the right time, fresh offensive was unleashed. Four years after the finest hour speech was D-Day. That began a recovery of freedom and truth, even though things had been very dark. It took a while. It took some years. There were a lot of hardships. A lot of sacrifices were made. But Churchill was right. Holding onto that island made all the difference in the world. And so for us in this place, the islands of the church and the family founded fundamentally in Christ alone is a sufficient place to stand. It should characterize our lives together and it should characterize the men who serve the church. Will you take your stand? Bow your heads with me. As Pastor Ryan comes to lead our hymn of invitation, I would not want you to leave this place without having heard the most important thing, which is only 
a commitment to Jesus Christ makes flourishing possible. And if you would say this morning that your life is characterized by brokenness in your relationships, by a dysfunction, by an alienation at every level, maybe you even feel alienated from your own body. Nothing works. It won't ever work until you say yes to Jesus. It won't ever work until you're brought back to life, renewed at every level through the gospel alone. And so we're gonna stand in a moment and sing. And I don't want you to hear that if you've blown it and messed up and are, and are, and are broken, that that's it's curtains for you. you know, the good news of the gospel is a loving God can change everything today. Don't forget that, that, that the letter of Timothy is written to a young man whose, whose father was out of the picture spiritually. But through the faithfulness of his mother and grandmother, that's what 2 Timothy says, through their faithfulness and their love of Jesus, even though there wasn't a godly man around, Timothy imbibed the faith. He went on to change the world. So no matter what's gone wrong, Jesus can begin the process of transforming everything right now. It all starts with him. Others of you, you may need a church home. You, you need those twin islands in your life and you care about your family and want it to do well and you love Jesus, but you're not connected to a church. Maybe you just moved here. Maybe you've gone through a, a hard season. Whatever it is, family flourishes best in the family of faith. And so you can come and take the first step of covenanting with us to serve Christ as his people together. And then finally, this altar is here for you. Moms and dads or couples. Maybe you just need to surrender afresh. I have to surrender every day to my calling to shepherd my family well. And in this cultural moment, the church is going to need to be filled with families that aren't ashamed to take their stand. Oh God, I pray that you would move in us, call us to obedience. Because you're good. And your glory is our heart's desire. Call us to obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand. This hymn of invitation is for you. As Pastor Ryan leads us and as we, as we sing, you come. Word. 
greatest song we could ever sing. And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. And worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Come on, let's sing his name. In Jesus, the name above every other name. In Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. your heads with me. As our time of invitation comes to a conclusion, I, I try to encourage you every week. Worship hasn't concluded until you've said yes to a call. What we've wanted to do together in this place is to fix our eyes on Jesus and to, to hear from him. A song that we sang together in worship before I preached was a was an acknowledgement that we want to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. What's the Spirit saying to you? What's the Spirit saying to you, especially men? You being faithful and obedient in your creation, in your calling? Would you be willing right where you stand? You know, we've been asking for revival and revival is always marked by a revival in families. The last thing the prophet Malachi says before the Old Testament concludes, the last prophetic word before silence, 400 years until Jesus came. The last word is that the hearts of the fathers will turn to the children. It's a revival in the family. So men, where you are, would you just say, yes, I'm going to be the shepherd leader in my home that God has called me to be. Ladies, can you say yes to God's design for your femininity? Not what the world says you are, but what the Bible says. Would you trust God to yield to your husband's leadership in the home? To encourage that in him be responsive to it in your own life. Children, that you would seek to honor your parents. It's a commandment. It's for your good. And that as gospel-centered families, we would be used to salt and light in a culture that's lost its way. Father, I pray that indeed you would do these things in our lives together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated? I want to share with you this morning. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, a family I got to spend some time with uh, this week, uh, the Creightons. And so I've got four cards. I want to get them all right. So it's David and Stacy and Ashley and Sabrina. Y'all come stand with me here. The Creightons are fairly new to the Eastern Shore, and uh, they have felt the Lord draw them to be a part of our lives together. They all uh, are uh, uh, um, 
proud to say they are followers, proud in a good sense of, of, of the term, to say that they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and they feel led by the Holy Spirit to plant their lives together in, uh, in this church. And so uh, we got to uh, spend some time talking uh, about all the good things that God is doing and uh, how he administrates the details of our lives. And so the, the Spirit has brought them uh, to this point of decision today. And so church... Uh, 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 having heard of their testimony uh, in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ and their desire to follow him in being a member here, uh, would you just say amen? Amen. amen. Well, I, I say this every time someone joins. First of all, we can't wait to see what God's gonna do in our church because he's brought you here. We are more like Jesus, more conformed into his image because you've been obedient today. Uh, you're the missing piece of our puzzle. And so we're excited to see how God sanctifies us and makes us more like Jesus because he's brought y'all here. And we can't wait to see what God's gonna do in your lives as individuals and as, as a family because you've been obedient today. God's got a new chapter, new things he wants to teach you and, and do uh, in you. And, uh, and we can't wait to see uh, what all that looks like. Uh, uh, we're gonna ask y'all to hang around here for a little bit after things are over, uh, but uh, appreciate you so much being obedient today. Cur encourages the rest of us to be obedient uh, in the ways God is calling us. Uh, before we close, before I pray, let me remind you, uh, we are gonna gather again for worship uh, tomorrow night to, to hear Dr. Chuck Kelly. Every Monday night has been so fantastic. You don't wanna miss it, all right? Uh, Chuck is an incredible biblical communicator, a scholar, uh, and, and uh, he has a word for us, and you're not gonna wanna miss that worship and that word. So 5.45 to eat, uh, and then 6.30 we'll worship together. Uh, if you would, please stand. Brent, am I remembering things? Oh, uh, if you come prepared to give, be, be sure and do that before you leave. There's uh, offering plates at the, uh, at the entrances, and you can, you can give your offering before you go. All right, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for meeting us uh, in worship today. Thank you for all of these who come. I, uh, uh, um, it's a uh, as summer wraps up, that's always kind of a distracting time that's pulling everybody in a lot of different directions. But I thank you for the faithfulness of your people to be uh, in your house, uh, worshiping you, um, encouraging one another, uh, and then all of us together uh, submitting to the, to, the, to the truth and the authority of your word. Lord, I pray that, that uh, our lives together would be enriched uh, and blessed because we've spent this time together with you in worship. Lord, I thank you for the Creighton family and for uh, their uh, obedience today. Lord, I pray that you would just confirm this decision in the days to come and that our church family would gather up around them and draw them in to our life together uh, and that you'd be honored as we serve you uh, ever more effectively uh, because we're, we're being made more and more like you all the time by your spirit. Lord, we love you. Send us now from this place to be salt and light in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed.